you can love or I, I love a lot of uh, studio work that's kind of based on landscape, but uh, actually seeing kind of the, the raw data that the artist is collecting and what they choose to focus on and, and also how they choose to experiment using the, using the paint and surface and texture and impasto. It, it's, there's, there's kind of an honesty to, um, uh, to plein air painting that I feel like uh, you, you know, maybe you see it in, in drawings as well. Um, like studio, you know, maybe like drawings from life. Uh, but, um, there's, there's just kind of like a, a directness to it that, that I, I find uh, just like incredibly revealing about the, the artist and their choices. There are a few artists my mind always goes to when I think of plein air and some of my favorite museums. Obviously, Monet, uh, this example by Sargent is always one that comes up. And I, I think that this captures exactly the same sentiment uh, that you were just talking about. And you can see it in the way that he captured the artist's uh, intention and the, in the sort of posture of his hand, how focused he is on capturing that moment. Uh, but also that it's about getting outside and relaxing. And you can see this artist's wife or girlfriend just kind of sitting and enjoying the moment. Um, some of the beautiful reflections on that wooden canoe, there were just a couple you know, flicks of, of paint, uh, simple but effective. Um, so, okay, so, so with that, we decided that instead of walking around uh, this gallery space um, in which I'm sitting, we would take everyone on a trip around the world. I know we all haven't been able to travel as much recently as we'd like to. So we're gonna start, let's see. We're gonna start here in New York. And this is a pin drop on exactly where I am sitting. Uh, Sugarlift is currently showing uh, on 28th Street, uh, between 10th and 11th in Chelsea in this gorgeous gallery space in partnership with Highline 9. If you have the opportunity to come and visit, uh, please do. From here, we're gonna travel to visit Lee in Scotland, Lee Craig Mild, who is uh, staying up late for us tonight. Um, thank you again, Lee. I'm not sure if your, uh, your audio is working yet, but as a quick introduction, uh, Lee grew up in Scotland, I hope I'm getting that right, and has always been interested in capturing the, the Scottish landscape. Um, he trained um, at the prestigious Florence Academy of Art uh, before moving back to his hometown and setting up his, his own painting studio. Lee, are you here with us? Hello, can you hear me? You can. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for joining. Um, I, I know you're very well known in uh, landscape and gallery circles. I was, I was very fortunate to have met you through this show. Um, and, and you bring not just a, a unique way of seeing, but also I think ge a geographic uniqueness to this show. All right. Um, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about your background, what, what inspired you to become a painter, focusing on landscape and also getting outside. Well, I mean, it all started when I was a kid, just traveling about Scotland with my parents and just enjoying the adventure of climbing hills and seeing Scotland for all it is. And I've always enjoyed drawing and painting, you know, I was pretty limited when I was young. And I always wanted the techniques and discipline to learn how to capture, you know, light and how to just to draw well. But I also appreciated, you know, a more impressionistic approach. You know, I remember looking at the likes of Constable and Turner and really enjoying their small studies that they would make before they became the large refined paintings. And I just really enjoyed the small ones because I just felt more true to being on location in a more refined painting. Um, so I grew up just you know, pursuing that as much as possible. Um, it took me a long time to find a school that could teach me 
um, disciplined academic techniques. So I wouldn't have to worry about the ability to capture. The only problem I wanted to have was to find something beautiful and um, to find the right time of day to capture, you know? Um, now that whole story of me getting to the academy is a long story, so I won't get into that, but I went to Florence Academy, uh, graduated, gained all the academic skills that I felt was necessary to, you know, just to learn how to draw using the site size method. That was a very handy thing to use. Um, and then I've, one of my main missions as well was to come back to Scotland and try and encourage it in this country as well. You know, just fundamental skills in drawing and painting that has been lost, especially in Glasgow. The Glasgow of Art lost a lot of steps and we, I want to come back and open up my own academy with my wife, Sarah Mark Gibson, who's also an artist and a teacher at the Florence Academy. Okay. So that's how I came to be being an artist professionally. And then, you know, having Scotland on my doorstep, there's an abundance of places I wanted to paint with the appropriate tools that was handed to me. Um, but, you know, if you ask any plein air artist, it's not a case of just going to a location that you think will be good and it'll work out, unless you go somewhere that's always reliably nice. You know, Scotland is unpredictable at best. You'll have four seasons in an hour sometimes. But that's, that for me was what makes plein air painting exciting. And, you know, you have to accept that you're going to fail sometimes. But if you get that one true gem, that's, that's what makes a really good painting in my book. Yeah, um, I'd be curious to hear your opinion. Um, I am not an art historian, so I may be off base in this. But I, I'm definitely a fan of Constable and Turner. And I know that in their time, uh, they were criticized for almost being seen as uh, kind of regressing from like an academic practice. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the progress in art, I guess, can be seen in waves where we now look at that as an advancement on human creativity and, and, and seeing. Um, when you think about progressing in your work, um, how do you how do you think of those two those two things both both your academic foundations but also capturing um, the moment? Well, with the development of academic um, understanding of drawing and painting, I find that a lot of things like I don't have to worry so much about the how do I create the right value, how do I create the right drawing. All that becomes automatic with the correct training you see, and all I can focus on is the impression or what's gonna happen with this next fleeting of light. And in Scotland, you can have, you may have five minutes to capture that light that's happening at distant mountain. Um, it'll just go away in five minutes or it might come back in half an hour. Um, to be able to make that quick understanding and response with your palette, it's, that for me was important. And without, the, the both are necessary in my book. Um, Lee, I, I've painted in Ireland, never Scotland, but it was very similar. The the weather, like it, I get four seasons in ten minutes. And uh, right. <laughs> how do you deal with that? If you like, if you start a painting, how do you how do you finish it? If it's you know storming ten minutes after you finished a sunny sky. Well, I mean, you have to accept that it's going to be a bit miserable sometimes, and acceptance of failure is important. <laughs> um, that's that's uh, some motto I live by. Um, and by the way, I, I was in Scotland ages ago, and it basically rained. I, I was on a cycling trip, and it rained nonstop for probably about two weeks. Okay. The, um, and all the drawing, it you know, there, there'd be these kind of big trees that would hide under and try to draw from under there. Mm -hmm. So um, I. I um, hugely admire the fact that you're even out there, you know, the subjecting yourself to every sort of element. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot you can do to, you know, help the situation, you know, good clothes, um, oh. hat, all the... How, how do you keep the rain off the, I mean, I, I, I know the water is not going to damage the painting, but what's your setup like? <laughs> well, if it's raining, if it's really bad, sometimes the rain will just be horizontal or it looks like it's coming off the ground. It's just, there's some days where it ain't going to work. It doesn't matter what you've come up with. But there are other days where I will have an umbrella attached to the top. Um, and that will take most of the rain off. Or find a tree nearby and go under that. 
but persistence is a huge element. You have to be stubborn and you have to think, you know, give it another hour, see how it goes. If it's still not very good, then try again later. But persistence is key, you know. Ali, this is the painting that we have hung currently in the gallery, beautiful landscape. And uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about this specific spot. We did our own re research and learned that it was in uh, the backdrop of both Braveheart and James Bond Skyfall. Uh, yeah. but potentially you have more of a personal connection to this space. Well, I mean, whenever you're traveling up north towards Fort William and Oban, the route you have to go through, you go through Glencoe. Now, just before you, you see Glencoe and all its amazing, majestic, it just opens up and it closes in into the Glen. Now, so many people I've talked to about going there, it's, it's amazing and they go straight into Glencoe and they never just turn left, just before that, into Glen Edith. And it's just amazing. It's just as spectacular as Glencoe, the actual valley inside it. Um, and in a lot of ways, it's better for a painter because it has a, a better body of water that runs through it. It's very useful for composition, you see. Um, but ultimately, it's where the light is happening. And that particular day, you know, the way the mountains are placed, you could have a wonderful scene over there in Glencoe or up all the way into Fort William. But if the light isn't working or if it's, not, if it's behind the wrong mountain, it's, it's folly to chase that. So at this particular time of day, which is about four o'clock into five, um, it just made sense to go down that valley and that view just opened up for me. Um, but again, there's a degree of luck that's involved in chasing that light. Um, but you just have to be you know, good with the roads and just set up as fast as you can and capture what you can see there and then. But yeah, I, the thing with Scotland is if you're gonna set up anywhere in that area, it's going to be recognized in a film. It's like walking about in New York. You're going to see, so, oh, that was in a film, or I saw that in Taxi. In Scotland, it's all, oh, that was in Braveheart. Oh, that was in Braveheart, too. Everyone's in Braveheart, especially if you're in the hills. But this is a very particular spot. And you can see why they chose it, because it does open up quite nicely. Well, Lee, I was trying to get away without being the ugly American traveler and, and couldn't quite pull it off. But we, we've got a lot, a lot of ground to cover since we're moving around the world. So we're going to have to keep moving. Thank you so much for being in the show. Uh, you and Sarah Margaret Gibson are extremely uh, talented couple. So um, thank you. Thank you both so much. Well, thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. We're going to come back to the U.S. to um, a slightly different climate, and we're going to pull up uh, Emily Lee. Emily, let me know when your, your audio is on. I think I'm on. Excellent. Yeah. Welcome. Hi. Thanks. It was fun. So very quick introduction, just to give people your chops. Uh, you studied illustration at RISD before studying at uh, GCA, Grand Central Atelier with Jacob Collins, um, before moving back to California. Um, can you tell us why we're this, this piece yeah, of Sure. Um, well, I picked this painting to share with you because I thought it was just a great illustration of what I love about plein air painting. Um, I was, I, I don't know where to start. Well. I, I think I fell in love with plein air painting because I spent the time before I went to GCA, I spent about 10 years really obsessed with rock climbing and it took me to some really amazing landscapes and I always found myself incredibly frustrated that I didn't have the painting skills to really capture the beauty I was seeing and it just drove me crazy and that's what kind of drove me to seek out the education I found at GCA. Even though I already had gone to RISD, I didn't feel like I learned um, what I was looking for there. So when I finished at GC, I found myself drawn back to the lifestyle I had as a rock climber, which is um, a lot of like sleeping in your car and traveling around and being very um, free and spontaneous and not having plans. And so on this particular trip, I um, showed up the night before after a really long drive and I 
slept out with my dog camping and I woke up in the rain and um, it would have been really easy to just kind of write off the whole day and say, well, it's raining. Cause it wasn't very, nothing looked scenic at all. And it was really raining. And so I, instead I had been there a lot before. I was really familiar with the area. So I started driving towards um, a little Northwest. The sky looked a little less uh, soft in. So I was really excited when I, I went down a really small um, side road and popped out from under the storm and saw this incredible sunrise lighting up the needles, which is part of Canyonlands National Park. And this moment only happened for like 10 minutes, but I was able to just pull my car over on the side of the road, whip out my easel and start painting. And I think I only got in the parts with the um, sun hitting the cliffs and to really get that color. And then the rest of it, I had to really paint from memory and just kind of making it up almost. But um, that's the kind of thing that I feel like all the training I did at GCA really paid off because it allows me, you know, the understanding of the technical um, use of color and value and drawing. Um, and then also just, I've done a lot of practice um, just working um, with like little bits of memory and it's actually really, it really works to strengthen your memory if you keep kind of putting yourself in these difficult situations where you don't have all the information. So I was just really excited that this happened. And um, it's so many times when I've had a successful painting come, it's usually really unexpected and comes out of a situation that seems really kind of hopeless in the beginning. And um, I've had to really learn how to just push myself into uncomfortable situations in, with the hope of you know having that magical moment appear in front of me. And um, yeah, there's something about that, like being outside with all the challenges of the elements and the discomfort that forces you to get out of your mind and just be really present and almost like channel some more intuitive um, creativity or just to be, you really don't have time to, to procrastinate or distract yourself. You gotta really just make the painting happen. And that's when the really magic stuff happens. So I find that when I'm in my studio, I tend to like overwork things and get too um, caught up in the details. And I still, you know, I wish I could overcome that. So that's something I, I still work on now. But I find that painting outside is when I really connect to that more intuitive space. It, it makes a lot of sense looking at your work. Um, I, I have one of your paintings just over my, my left shoulder right here. Um, and it's a, a beautiful plein air landscape of a mountain range. And it feels like just that perfect moment when the sun's setting and this like, this like light, the golden hour light hits the mountain range and it can only last for an instant. Yeah. <laughs> the paint, you know, it's gonna take longer than that. So it's interesting to hear how memory Sort of, sort of enters your process. Yeah. Another thing that's really helped me is just studying um, other people's paintings and old paintings and going to museums. I find that if I can try to imprint some of that in my mind, the next time I'm outside, I'll see it more like through this sort of filter or lens of, as, you know, oh, this is like right now I'm really into Soroya, so I'm trying to like see Soroya everywhere. <laughs> but I find that's what really keeps me motivated is to just like immerse myself in this, like these older paintings that really excite me and then try to see those moments around me in, in nature. Um, so this is my car that, um, this is actually my old car, but I have the same car. I just love this car so much. So I bought a new newer version of this car. But I took the back seats out and it has a bed platform in the back so that when the front seats go down, um, the front seats go down, the bed platform folds out so the entire inside of the car is, is a flat area. And then I store my art supplies underneath and I also have a roof box. And so it's great for camping and it has four wheel drive so we can go everywhere. And um, that's my dog, Honey. I just love painting with her. She's such a great companion and so peaceful. Um, this is another, spot where I like slept in this spot and I was able to wake up and paint right from my campsite at sunrise, which is so helpful because it's, you know, it's hard to get up really early and um, get to the spot while that light is happening. Is yeah. there a significant overlap among uh, 
climbers and uh, and plein air painters? Um, I don't think in the style that I've pursued, um, there's quite I a few careers. I think one, actually. What's that? I think you're the only one I know of. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a lot of climber friends who are artists, and most of them um, just don't have the same, haven't invested the same kind of training, time and training I have. So, you know, they're doing like illustrations and linear drawings and watercolors. And that's what I was doing before I went to GCA. And I just had this moment where I realized I was never going to make a living doing that. And I wasn't really going to stand out. Um, my other creative friends at the time, went on to become filmmakers and photographers who have become really successful and famous. And, and I just saw them doing that. And I knew that I didn't like, they have to work on the computer all day long editing. And um, it's just so much computer time. And I really didn't want that for my lifestyle. So that was another reason I was really like in, inspired to try to, you know, learn these skills so that I could spend my time like painting in nature and not working on a computer. Hearing you talk about it, uh, I don't think I ever made this connection before, but uh, talking about like land, plein air painting, like you're, you're so in the moment when you're plein air painting and it feels, uh, you know, like you have so little time that you're completely immersed. And I, I mean, there's, you know, minus the like falling and dying part. <laughs> it's true. It's similar kind of a concentration and focus to rock climbing. Yeah. It's so true. Yeah. And I do a lot of yoga and meditation too. And I find, you know, similarities to all these activities, they just get you out of your head and you, in a more present state of mind. Um, so, you know, it also I, feels like, like what you're talking about, that feeling of being truly there yeah. and it's truly there, truly present, truly connected to everything. It's almost the opposite of being in front of a screen, right? Yeah. That's the opposite <laughs> of the way that we feel being online. And I know that being online is the only way that a lot of us can like connect to each other. There's a lot of good. I feel like in painting, I don't feel like I struggle a little bit with how uncomfortable it is for my body because I'm very athletic and physical and I find that painting just really hurts sometimes because I have to sit still for so long. So as I get older, I struggle with that more and more because I'm less willing to put myself through the suffering. <laughs> I, I remember painting near you in the Catskills, Emily, and looking over and I'm just like seated, seated in like a comfy chair, kind of yeah. painting in this tiny little world. And I look over and you were doing like push-ups, just like it's taking a step back from the easel and doing push-ups. Yeah, I, <laughs> I like to feel good. But you know, it's, I figured out, I, I think I've, my style has been getting looser and looser because of that. Like I just don't have the patience to sit through these really long, sessions or I'll come back for multiple sessions to get more details in a painting. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, Emily, be before you, if, because this is something I've always meant to ask because I've kind of followed you online and we met briefly and you said that you were basically traveling and painting. And to me, uh, at that point, kind of home was very, very small kids that just, that seemed intensely, like an intensely gorgeous life, right? That, and um, what would be your, what's your dream trip? for like when, you know, what, what's your dream plein air slash, you know, rock climbing trip for, you know, when we can all travel again? <laughs> That's a good question. Well, um, my husband and I went to Sardinia a little over a year ago to go rock climbing and I did a little bit of painting, but the whole time I was just like, ah, oh, it's so beautiful. I want to stop and paint more. <laughs> so I've had a little bit of this like longing to go back there and paint. And we were there in the spring after a really wet year and we we're just driving through these like gorgeous farm pastoral scenes with poppies in the fields and, and the history. I think, yeah, I've done a lot of painting in the out west in America, which is something I really missed and craved while I was in New York. And now I think, I don't know, yeah, I, I, there is a part of me that would love to like go to some older places in Europe and paint there. Um, but I've actually been really enjoying during COVID, I've been home and painting. It's been such a time of growth and change for me. I've been painting more um, fruit trees and flowers and still lifes and just trying to connect more with the spirit of this town where I live and I've been here for three years but spent a lot of that time traveling so um, it does feel like I've kind of turned a page and settled into a like a little bit more of a studio practice combined with plein air um, I do miss yeah the, the trips 
I'm, I'm looking forward to going on a trip again, but um, it's almost like the trips filled a space in my life where I couldn't, I didn't have a house or a studio and it was cheapest for me to just live out of my car. And so that was just what worked for me. Like I, I couldn't really like living a settled life just wasn't working for me because the bills were too high. So um, now that I'm settled down more, I'm finding my art is adapting in, in an interesting way and kind of allowing me to explore more things. Well, Emily, thank you so much for, for joining. And uh, it's, it's amazing to see, you know, a landscape like this where it's, it's plein air, it's immediate, you capture the moment, but of a geography that was clearly carved uh, over a very, very- Yeah, it's so cool. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna hop back on the road. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna put you in the back seat and we're gonna head down to, let's see, I think we're going down south now. We're letting Google Earth do some of the driving to Elba, Alabama. Um, everyone who's on, raise your hand if you've been to Elba, Alabama. Uh, so one of the things we love about Plan Air Painting is it takes us to places that we have not yet been. Uh, we're coming down to Elba to visit uh, Peter Van Dyke, who's actually dialed in from Philadelphia, splits his time. Um, Peter, your bio, when I was clipping it, was one of the most enjoyable I've read. Uh, a painter, a draftsman, and a general life enthusiast. Um, what more could you ask for? Uh, Peter contemplates the nature of existence to the irritation of his family and friends, something I can relate to. Um, and Peter teaches painting and drawing at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. Um, I have to say, Peter, as part of your introduction, I have uh, one of the paintings we'll show tonight in the gallery right in front of me. And you're definitely a painter's painter. Uh, many people have come in and, and, and made a beeline to your painting, uh, but most painters that come into our gallery have a, very, are, are, uh, have a very strong reaction positively to your work. So, uh, you know, quickly, can you just tell us your secret formula? <laughs> oh, um, uh, time? I don't know. Um, no, I know that's really nice. I mean, I usually when people say that you're a painter's painter, um, that means that nobody buys your paintings, which, <laughs> um, which is, which is fine. But, um, no, I, I, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, no, I, I don't know. I, I don't have, um, uh, I don't have much in the way of, of secret formulas, sadly. Um, I probably have a kind of strange process, I guess, not one that I've thought about too much, but, um, yeah, I don't know. What do you mean strange process? Well, I mean, it sounds, I mean, I, I will, um, I'm kind of a tinkerer, I guess, by nature. And so um, I will pick things up and, and play with them for a few months and then just let them go for a while. And um, I think, every, I don't know, everything is very, very open-ended for me. Um, I'm not, not even remotely um, comfortable with the idea of being done with anything. Um, I just like working on the paintings, you know? I mean, um, the painting for me is like, it's like um, a house that you're living in and working on at the same time. Um, and so like, you're always kind of trying to make it livable, right? But you're also trying to change it at the same time. Um, and so that's the way I see my paintings. I mean, I just kind of um, look at them and I think, oh, I want to get back into that world and, and, uh, and just start to, dig through the space and change things as they've changed out there in the world. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 it's very, very open-ended. It's chaos. It's a mess is what it really is. I, I've heard, and Ted, maybe this was you when you were describing Peter's work, that you attack the canvas. And I'm curious, um, I, I was being sort of facetious asking about your secret recipe, but uh, more seriously, do you, has your, uh, has your process of painting evolved and does it, you know, do, do you approach one painting to the next very differently or are you trying to kind of resolve a process that develops an image uh, or a painting the, the, way, um, the way that you see the space, the way that you see the world? Um. So, I mean, my goal has always been to sort of move towards a process that was um, open to 
pretty much anything at any time um, because uh, you know if you have a process that that has a kind of distinct uh, linear direction to it like what you're attuned to when you're looking at the world is is controlled by what your process will allow you to um, to see at that at that time and so like I found that if I had a process that I where I knew what was going to happen, like I was just closed to a lot of of possibility, uh, and so um, I just decided that I would just do whatever I wanted whenever I felt like it, and um, and that so you know that that has caused me to do all kinds of um, unholy things to my paintings that. Um, that, you know, you just, when, when you want to do it, you just do it. And, and I, I feel like, um, I hate the thought of, of things being overdetermined. Like, I don't want to know what's going to happen. That's, that's, whenever I think I know what I'm going to do, I, I, it's just really, really boring to me. Um, so in order to keep it exciting, I, I just keep everything on the table all the time, but that's also like super, um, that's that's exhausting because you never you never get to say like oh I did that you know you never there's nothing to, to land on really um, you just yeah. let them, I just let them go yeah I definitely uh, agree with you know the idea of having unlimited possibilities ahead of you as one of one of the joys in life and you know when I when I think about um, when I think about the way that you paint. Uh, the way you describe it, you know, it could veer towards when you think of almost like automatic painting, like a like a du buffet where he's just trying to think as little as possible and get it on the canvas. But your painting is less like that because you are trying to represent the space around you. It's more like you're being agile and just figuring out what what in the moment uh, sort of draws you to make the next mark. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I I have. Um, uh, I kind of follow, you know, sensations around the space and try to pick things up and I see what, you know, I don't know what kind of opportunities are, are showing up um, on the, on the canvas. And uh, yeah, it's funny. I, I, I think way too much. I mean, that's, I'm like, I just can't stop thinking. I mean, I, I but some of the only times when I really get kind of quiet is when, um, when I'm just like hyper focused on on something out there in the world, um, and that's that's like other folks have mentioned here tonight. I mean, uh, that's just where you want to be. You know, you want to just feel like there's nothing between you and and the world, uh, and painting just demands that uh, from you. And, and so uh, that's that's really fun for me. It takes a while to get in that spot sometimes, but um, once you're there, it's it's really worth it. Is there a distinction between your plein air work, which can be quite large, and your studio work, or do you kind of approach it all sort of similarly? It's it's all the same. I I, I don't see any. I don't I don't understand any of the differences between the um, alleged genres of painting. That makes no sense to me. It's like painting is like space and light and form. Uh, so I don't know. That's always the case. You know, and space is, you know, space is there at, at every level of scale. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't know, like you can be standing in front of a mountain range and if you're far enough away, it has no space to it. But you can be standing in your at your kitchen table and like lower your head enough and get close enough to the kitchen table. And like the space will unfold like, you know, the biggest space in the world. So I think you know, any, it's really a matter of how you position yourself and, and how you experience a space. And, and for me, it's never made any difference whether it was inside or outside or still life or landscape, it's all the same thing. But it seems like it, your paintings are like when a car is parked and then drives away, like that changes. Oh, that pisses me off. Right. <laughs> but I, I, actually, I actually have a boot that I bring with me, like a, like a you know, one of those, I will boot a car. I have no problem doing that. I've flattened tires. <laughs> so don't no, the trick, by the way, the trick to painting cars. An air painting? What's that? Oh, just to, to, you know, advising people not to get in your way when you're plein air painting. Yeah, yeah. No, the trick to painting cars is, is to paint the cars of the people who work at the store that you're painting. 
because they're there all day. You get, never paint the customer's cars. It's a huge mistake. Everybody knows that. Peter, I've got a question for you on space because when I, when I walked through the Met, it seems like there was a period in time, again, I'm not an art historian, but in the 14th, 15th century where there, science started to be applied to perspective in space. Mm -hmm. And it went from figuring out that things in the background were smaller, but exactly how much smaller they should be. And when I look at a painting like this, this is actually the painting that's in the gallery in front of me. Um, there's a lot of perspective going on. There's, it's, it's very believable, but it doesn't quite feel like you got out a ruler and measured and calculated exactly what should be there. So, so how do you think about that? The, the, it's very believable as if you did calculate it, but it's also, um, it feels kind of more ethereal, like you're there in the moment experiencing the space. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll try to explain that without, I, I have, I have elaborate, elaborate thoughts about that. But, but basically, my, the, my approach to that is that, um, you know, as you move your head around a space, and as you sort of take in uh, objects or, or planes or whatever, um, you know, you create basically a kind of a theoretical viewfinder, in a sense, like a theoretical picture plane, and that, that picture plane changes every time you apprehend some new sensation. So like you're moving around like that. And my feeling is that the size of that picture plane is completely subjective. And the orientation of that picture plane is completely subjective. So the, like you just have endless amounts of space to play with, you know, how objects are postured, like what's the posture of the form relative to something else. Uh, and so I just, I mean, there's a kind of perspectival logic to, um, uh, you know, to the paintings, but it's a very flexible one. You know, I, I, the, the easiest way to explain it for me is like if, if you had a, like a cage that was like a, th a three-dimensional uh, Cartesian grid, like X, Y, and Z axis. And if you could imagine that traditional perspective, like everything sits comfortably in that rectilinear format, but like you could take that cage and like actually kind of, move it and and bend it and twist it in such a way as to sort of drag all the objects with it so that i mean the easiest way to explain it is like that i think space has a gesture but that gesture is actually the the, the gesture of the painter as they look around the space did i successfully avoid answering that question no i think you successfully bended uh space and time which is I, yeah i i bent the question you bent reality to your will and <laughs> On that, Peter, th thank you so much for being part of this. Um, so many people, I, myself included, were excited to get to meet you, uh, put a face to a name. We really enjoyed having your work in the show. We're going to head back up to New York. Uh, so, Valerie, if we could get you mic'd up. Now, we're not coming back to Sugarlift's gallery. We're going to head up to the Bronx. Hey, Valerie. Hi, do you hear me? There okay. I am. Hey, Valerie. Yeah. Hi, thanks for including me. I'm very excited to be here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much for being here. Um, now, Valerie, uh, we got to see you at the, the actual opening and just the other day. Um, can you tell us how you got into painting, not just the, what people think of as a typical landscape, but the landscape of, of urban decay? Sure. <laughs> I, I had a fairly traditional art school background. I went to Ducray School of the Arts and then the Art Students League and the National Academy of Design. I actually thought I was going to be a figure painter. But after you get out of art school, nobody wants to pose. <laughs> it's just a fact of life. And I didn't have any money, so I couldn't afford models. So I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? And the one thing that's been consistent in my practice since art school is I like working from life as instead of photographs. I have nothing against photographs. If you need one, occasionally I do use one if something won't still stay still and stuff. But mostly I just really like working from life. So after I got all done with art school, I moved to Jersey City, New Jersey, a very urban and industrial area. As a matter of fact, the park where I used to work, walk my dog in, in Jersey City overlooked a vast industrial park. So I'm like, huh, 
So I start painting from that park and doing some industrial scenes. And I start going into, I've always had a car. You live in New Jersey, you always have a car, which I call my paint mobile, my mobile studio. So I would drive into these industrial parks when I lived in Jersey City. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna set up here and paint. And I really enjoyed doing that. I love the forms, the shapes, they're very sculptural. And that sort of set me on a trajectory of painting urban landscapes. Now, when I started, I didn't realize that I would be doing um, urban scenes for 30 something years as I am now. So after I um, was painting in New Jersey for many years, I met a great guy, my husband, and I moved to New Rochelle, New York, um, I guess about 17 years ago. And I live in Southern New Rochelle. I'm in the Bronx in 10 minutes. And I was used to painting urban scenes in New Jersey. So when I got to New Rochelle, I said, well, what am I gonna do now? I really love New Jersey. <laughs> anyway, I'm like, just start driving around, which is what I do. I never know what I'm gonna paint from one year to the next. I just drive around until I see something that speaks to me. And then I set up my easel and I start painting. I do sketches, I do studies, because I do very large paintings on location, a little bit different than some of the other plain air paintings, painters in the show. Um, I like to work large. Uh, the one in the show is kind of a medium size, but still it took me six weeks to paint. So I, I set up my easel and I go back many times. Um, uh, anyway, this scene, the, this picture here is from me painting at a um, abandoned golf center in the North Bronx. Um, once again, I didn't know what I was going to paint. I was just driving around and then out of the corner of my eye, I really love color, by the way. That's sort of one of my main things. I love colorful scenes. So I saw this colorful thing while I was driving down Route 95 and I got right off the next exit. I pulled my car, I parked. I, I found that it was this abandoned golf center and I just started walking around it. And then I saw there was a break in the fence. So I crawled through the fence. I popped out into this place and I'm like, oh my God, this place is spectacular. There's these beautiful colors and this graffiti and over, all this overgrown stuff. And one of the things I've always been interested in my work is the way nature and the built world collide. And this abandoned Bronx golf center had that it was amazing. And so I wound up painting here for almost two years. Yeah, Valerie, I, I'm thinking about the uh, Temple of Dender in the Met, and you see that over time, obviously those are multiple thousand year old structures, but you see people carving their names into the stone over mm -hmm. millennia. Um, and I think it was Alexander the Great who aspired to sort of graffiti carve his name into the walls of history. Um, I loved hearing the stories about how when you share pictures of your paintings that the graffiti uh, community will, will identify people's tags who've been captured in your work. Oh yeah, I love that. When I post something on Instagram, you know, most of the time I have no idea who the, who the graffiti writers are. But when I post on Instagram, people will say, hey, I did that, or, or the, somebody will tag somebody. Um, a lot of them, I can't even read them, but they're just, you know, I guess it's sort of fun. It's a burst of color. And you're right about um, graffiti uh, or it's been around for millennium. I mean, the cave paintings. I was down in Guatemala. Actually, I should say this is kind of a side note. I absolutely love ancient ruins. My husband and I went to Egypt for our honeymoon. I was down in Guatemala with my husband um, a few years ago and the, the uh, guide took us through these ancient Inca runes and we got to see ancient, you know, graffiti that was hundreds of years old. The guide was like, oh, look at this. And I'm like, you know, it's always been such that people want to leave their mark. They want to just put a little something out there and be remembered, even if it's sort of anonymous. We all want to leave our mark on, on this place that we're only here for a short time. I, and I, I like capturing that. I like capturing the runes. I like capturing the nature. Um, and early on, when I first started painting in Jersey City, I started painting a mostly industrial stuff. There was no graffiti in my early work at all. That didn't happen until I started painting in the Bronx. Um, I like to think of the Bronx as the birthplace of contemporary graffiti. 
Graffiti's been around for many, many years, obviously. But um, there was something about the Bronx in the 70s and the 80s, the trains. And um, so the Bronx is still full of graffiti. It's, it's just beautiful. Some of it is just hit and run tagging. Some of it is amazing murals. But I love the way that adds some color and life to the contemporary landscape, the contemporary urban landscape. And in my earlier paintings, I always liked um, signage. So um, like lettering and stuff. I took a lettering class in art school at Ducray School of the Arts. I didn't like it at first, but once I started getting into it, I'm like, oh, this is kind of fun. So my earlier industrial landscapes often had some kind of lettering or signage. And then now that I'm painting in the Bronx and the surrounding areas, um, I kind of like when sometimes I have graffiti and signage because the graffiti is another form of lettering. Beautiful in many instances, but it's another form of lettering. And it's another mark that we leave on the world. Well, I think this that's painting a, a here that you have up right now. Um, in addition to urban landscapes with graffiti, I also do a lot of uh, waterfront scenes and, and other things like this. And this is in the Bronx. It's these old docks. At one point, this was a very heavy industrial area. Now they're in disuse and disrepair. And it's just, um, they're kind of beautiful in their own right. Well, Valerie, it's a, it's a very beautiful sentiment that we're all trying to leave our mark. And I think that is a motivator, a motivation that uh, all artists, that every, everybody can connect with. We have one more artist who on this call who's trying to leave his mark. Uh, so we're gonna have to keep moving. Thank you so much for joining Valerie. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Valerie. So we're, oh, and actually here, here's the last picture of the, of the painting we have here in the gallery and just wanted to show it in, in the context of the space. This is a painting and a picture you've got to spend time with. But we got to keep moving. Um, so, we are now going way across the country, out of the continental states and up to Alaska, where David Pettibone is, is leaving his mark in the snow, uh, his footprints in the snow. So David, when you uh, let me know when you've got your audio on. Yeah, I'm here. Excellent. Th thanks so much for, for joining us. Um, Absolutely. David uh, studied at, at RISD. Um, and got his MFA from the New York Academy of Art. Um, and just like all the artists who are joining us tonight, uh, provide such a unique perspective through their work. Um, David and, and uh, Ted and Dina, feel free to, to jump in. But we'd love to hear, you know, what brought you way, way out west and north? Yeah, actually, David, I, so, so, so me and David went to school together, and I've always meant, meant to ask, um, you know, um, and, and then he and as the next thing I knew, he was in Alaska, um, kind of make it doing this incredible project where he spent a year painting a cottonwood tree, uh, um, the, um, in every single weather condition, which in Alaska were really, really extreme. And I've always, I mean, other than being kind of in awe of it, I was always meant to ask, how did life take you there? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dina. Um, yeah, so, uh, well, I wanted to thank, um, I want to thank you, Dina and Sugarlift and Ted for, for this opportunity. It's fantastic to be able to, to share some of this with you guys. Um, so I was in New York with, with Dina and um, went to the Academy of Art and was there for about a decade. Um, I went to uh, first went to Alaska. It was, it was actually my second trip, but it was kind of an eye-opening trip. And I went to um, Ukiavik, the most northern uh, town um, in the United States. It's kind of on the, the, the very top, uh, the very tip of Alaska, the very farthest north tip. Um, and I painted um, uh, subsistence whaling up there. The, the Inupiat culture does um, subsistence whaling still. And it was an incredible experience. I was there for about seven months and this was back in 2013. Um, went back to New York in 2014 and um, just realized, uh, I'm originally from Arizona um, and I just realized I, I, I missed the access to nature that I, that I used to have. 
and Alaska kind of reminded me um, of what I was, what I needed kind of for my soul. So uh, 2015, I moved back to, I moved up to Alaska from New York. Um, and this, this project, the Year of the Tree project was, was kind of in the back of my mind, even when I was in New York, uh, towards the later years of New York, uh, the idea of, uh, especially in New York, when everything is, is such, um, there's such bustle and movement and, you know, time just flies. Um, I started to think about what would it be like to slow time down and spend, spend as much time, um, kind of like what, what, what Ted does, spend as much time as I can with one subject and really get to know that subject. Um, uh, so I wanted, I, I was thinking about picking one tree and spending a year painting from that one tree. Um, and I did something when I first moved to Alaska, did something similar to this where I spent a season painting from one scene. So as the snow melted, I would I would add layers to my canvas by painting out the snow and continue to change the painting until I had the final layer. The viewer doesn't know all the transitions, but you see that texture. Um, but with Year with the Tree, it was just like what Dina said. It was, um, I did, I think, 70 plus paintings. Uh, so about every other day, I would go back out to this cottonwood and paint the cottonwood. And, and the elements was a huge part of it. So if it snowed, um, when, during the bug season, the, some of those um, mosquitoes would get stuck in the, the paint film. I, uh, I got attacked by slugs uh, one day. Um, I had some bears pass by. Um, all of the elements that would leave an imprint in the, the paint film became a part of that, that story for me. Um, now, Ted, does it say something about you or David that David chose to study the harsh conditions of the Alaskan forest and you chose to study the beach in Long Island? <laughs> you know, I, I do paint in storms occasionally, but it's, it's definitely, it, there are no bears on the beach. The deer has come close, but never a bear. David, we'd love to hear more about the unique process of painting in Alaska, I know when I turn the air conditioning down too much, I get complaints in the gallery that it's hard for some people to type when their hands freeze. Mm -hmm. um, but I think uh, you would find a, not very much sympathy for those people. I'd love to hear how painting and conditions like in this picture sort of affect your ability just to execute a painting. Sure, yeah, uh, so it definitely, it, it thickens the paint significantly, that cold. Um, but I mean, a lot of, in the middle of winter, when I was doing, working on this, um, the Year of the Tree series, it was below zero uh, for, for several days. Um, but the paint doesn't, obviously, it, it, it doesn't freeze up. You end up mixing a lot of Gamsol or thinner into it to really be able to get it on your brush and put it on the canvas. And that slows down the process. But um, uh, it's a process that I really enjoy and, and, and painting in the cold, there's something, I mean, just part of, I think, why I like uh, Alaska um, in the winters, it, it's just beautiful and it, it can be very invigorating. Um, so being outside in that is, um, it's refreshing. Uh, and it, if you're layered, so I, I, as I was painting, I kind of figured out some some ways I could get around the, the extreme cold. Uh, one was standing on that cardboard, uh, just provided that extra layer of insulation between um, the snow and my feet and made all the difference in the world. Um, multiple layers everywhere. Uh, the, the, even the mitts that, I'm, that I was wearing, um, I, have, I have gloves inside that. And then of course a hole in the mitt to hold on to the brush. Um, and the biggest thing that I learned is um, when you're out painting in that kind of cold, um, if you take a lunch break, you've, you've really screwed yourself because the, the blood will, in your, in your body, a lot of that will leave your limbs and go to help you digest. And suddenly your, your, um, your limbs just get incredibly cold. Um, so I'll, I would go out with a, a thing of coffee, but... Um, I purposely wouldn't 
wouldn't bring any food. Otherwise, the, the trip would have been kept short. Um, so that's the tree on the right hand side there that I was painting. Um, it's a probably at least 200 set 200 years old. Uh, and two winters ago, or no, actually last, last winter, it, it collapsed in a, in a, a wind windstorm. So I, my timing was, was pretty right on. Um, I'm glad I was able to paint it before it fell over. You can see my, my coffee thermos down there. That was, that was the extent of um, the breaks. And, and that, so these paintings are, um, I did four large paintings. These are uh, six foot by nine foot paintings. And it's made up of uh, six three by three canvases that I would I would um, hike in uh, to to the tree with, and each canvas is painted in a different um, uh, sort of climate situation. So this this large painting was painted over the course of two months, uh, December and January, and if it was um, rainy, then then I would take um, probably that. I'm guessing maybe that middle right canvas with me and I would paint that one in the rain. If, if it was snowing, then I would take maybe the middle left. If it was um, just overcast, I would take an, another one that was just overcast. And during that, that time, this, you, the sun doesn't come up over the mountains because I'm in a valley. So um, those top two canvases were probably my last, the last canvases that I did because you can start to see some direct light. So that must have been um, later in January when I did those. And th that would have been obviously um, sunny. The, uh, and I labeled each one, each canvas is labeled the, the specific weather condition. Well, David, it's, uh, it's fascinating for us to watch um, you know, when someone is so focused on one thing, how much they can achieve in, um, in their ambitions in, in any medium. But we're fascinated to, to watch you capture uh, these spaces. And uh, for the, Hannah, maybe we can, I, 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 we blew through our hour, but maybe we have time for a question or two. If, if one of the questions is, how do I collect David's work, but I don't have, a six foot by nine foot space. Uh, he does have a, a much smaller painting. It's probably six inches by nine inches here in the gallery. That's one of my absolute favorites in the show. Um, David, it's been great to get to know you better through this exhibition. And thank you. We want to stay close, if not geographically. Um, uh, thank, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah, thank you. And it looks like there are a lot of questions. I don't know if you can boil it down to the, the very best question among them. <laughs> Ooh, that's tricky. So many good ones. And I wish we could get to them all. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to see if we can squeeze in time for two. So uh, the first one from Lydia, um, and perhaps all the artists can, can weigh in on this briefly, but where do we all land on the idea that plein air painting can't be finished in a studio? Is that like, are we purists here? Or is that something that we can get away with a little bit? Ted, maybe, maybe you had Ted and Dina ideas about that when curating the show. I mean, I, I don't think that it's like up to me to say, to define like how a genre should work for any painter besides myself. And, you know, for me, I, I, the only thing I do to my paintings in the studio, um, so away from the subject is just sign them and, and sometimes put some varnish on. But uh, I, I like the immediacy of reacting to, you know, for better or for worse, reacting to what I'm seeing. And I think uh, any, any attempt to like fix something or, or clarify something that I wasn't able to clarify out there would diminish for me that the the kind of the direct uh, experience that I'm trying to convey and, and a little bit like we we're saying with, with Emily and climbing, like you're just totally immersed. You're in this world and you're, you know, you're 100% you're focused and 
uh, when you get back to the studio, it's a, it's a very different mindset. So I, I think uh, for me, not, not for, not for Peter, but, uh, uh <laughs> but for me it is. And so I, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to change anything away from my subject. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, I guess the final question before we all sign off, um, Colton asked about kind of the trends of plein air painting, you know, for the people who have been doing this for 10 years, um, you know, Ted, you mentioned at the beginning how it's kind of unusual to see this genre in, you know, the Chelsea, the Chelsea gallery. Um, so maybe how is it, how has it changed in the past 10 years and kind of forward looking, where do we think it's going? Is it a, a bright future for plein air painting, you know, maybe from a participation side from the artist, but also from a collector's point of view, uh, you know, is there, is there a market for it? I personally think so. Like I, you know, personally seeing these locations on this earth is so amazing because that's, you know, how so many of us connect with art is, you know, by things that we know, um, you know, for, for lay people, I think that that tie in to somewhere where we can say, oh, I've been there could be really, really important. I could put two cents in there. Um, since I've been doing this probably, I'm a little bit older probably. So I've been painting urban, what I call urban plein air for 35 plus years. I don't see that painting on site is ever going away. It, it's been with us ever since we had paint in a tube. You know, once they got it out of, you know, you had to grind your own in the studio and the impressionists had it in a tube, they were ready to go out there. And as other people have said, being right there in the world and painting directly, you really have to be focused. There's something exciting and fresh about it. Even for somebody like me who spends weeks or even months at a site, there's something that's so energizing about that. And there are stories to be told in the world around us. And I think getting that direct um, experience does translate into the canvas and people will always Viewers will always be interested in that. I don't see it ever going away. I'd like to just add that um, moving out to California from New York City, it's like everything here is plein air painting. It's like that's that's what art is out here, and it's like super vibrant, awesome. Um, that's it. Just feel like people out here have a much stronger connection to nature and appreciation for it. Um, so I feel like that's a little bit of a New York City. I don't know, not problem, but I mean, maybe a problem for us. But, um, yeah, I think you go to places where people, you know, their life is more focused on nature that they really connect to the planar paintings more naturally. Well, Emily and Valerie, thank you for, for wrapping it up. And, and Valerie, obviously landing on another universal truth um, that the planar paint is out of, out of the tube and there's no going back. Just to wrap up, I want to, I want to thank all the artists in this show. Um, everyone who, who hasn't had the opportunity, definitely check out each of these artists, Instagram, go to their website. If you love them, reach out. Uh, all of the work in the show is on sugarlift.com, so you can check it out there. If you love it, collect it. It supports them in a lot of important ways. Um, we're gonna make this globe available where you can travel around the world and zoom in on locations represented by other artists in the show. So you'll be able to find it at sugarlift.com slash earth. And of course you can go to sugarlift.com slash plan air to see all the work that's, that's available for, for you all to collect. Um, for both collectors and artists, you can make offers so uh, if the artist wants the deal, maybe, maybe you'll get a deal. Uh, if you're an artist, maybe they'll make an even better deal. We'll see. Um, if you have any questions along the way, always feel free to reach out uh, to Hannah or myself. We can both be found at hello at sugarlift.com. Um, I just, before the big thank you, I just wanna say thank you to my mom who's listening. It's her birthday tomorrow, so happy birthday, mom. I love you, um, and hope everyone joins me in saying that to my mom and your moms. Um, 
on that, I just want to thank everyone who's been involved in the show, all the artists, Ted, Dina, Hannah, the Sugarlift team. Um, it's amazing getting to explore a simple idea and seeing all the interesting ways that you all take it, all, all, the, all the interesting ways that, that you all see. Um, it makes our, this is the best part of life for us. So thank you for providing that. Um, look